What do bananas, kale, and avocados all have in common? Potassium. What is potassium? What role does it play in the body? What's a normal range for potassium? And what happens when potassium is too high or too low in the body? Hi, I'm Abby and I'm an RN and one of my favorite departments to work on is the cardiovascular ICU. These patients are some of the sickest of the sick and their clinical picture can really be a complex puzzle. And patients with wonky lab values, those can be especially tricky. As tricky and complex as lab values can be sometimes though, it's not impossible to remember what are considered the normal levels and what you need to do as the nurse to provide the best care for your patients when those levels fall out of normal range. If you need some help, go download a free cheat sheet at nursing.com slash lab values for a quick reference on normal lab values and their ranges. A cardinal rule of administering IV potassium is that you never give it IV push. You may have learned this in nursing school and it's definitely something that you will practice as the nurse. Why do you think that is? To answer that, we first need to understand what potassium is and the role it plays in the body. Potassium is a critical mineral or electrolyte that plays a large role in electrical impulses in the body. Why do we need to care about that? Well, what do we know about organs such as the heart? The heart's myocardial cells receive electrical impulses that cause contraction, which makes the heart pump. Wonky electrical impulses could equal ineffective pumping or even lead to deadly arrhythmias. If that happens, the heart won't pump blood effectively to the body. So eventually, the organs will fail. To help us get a picture of just how important potassium is, I want to share a patient story that actually happened. When I was working on the CVICU, we replaced electrolytes quite often. Early in my career, while I was being oriented to the unit, I held tight to that rule of never pushing IV potassium. Even when my preceptor was providing instructions that conflicted with that big rule. CV patients are often in need of electrolyte replacement. Their labs are closely monitored for all electrolytes, but especially potassium and magnesium for cardiac concerns. Where I worked, the providers placed PRN orders for electrolyte replacement and the ICU nurses are given the authority to pass clinical judgment on when replacement is actually needed. This is all done in accordance with the lab values from the patient. We had just gotten our patient's lab results back and upon evaluation of the complete metabolic panel, we noticed that the patient's potassium was below normal limits. Pop quiz. What are the normal lab values for potassium? Make sure to comment below. If you said 3.5 to 5.0 mil equivalents per liter, you nailed it. Now, if you want to take a more challenging quiz to test your knowledge on potassium, I put a link in the description below. Okay, so now we know our normal range levels and my patient's potassium was 3.1 mil equivalents per liter. So not too crazy low, but they definitely needed a replacement. Being below that lower range of 3.5 mil equivalents per liter means that my patient was hypokalemic. 
the signs and symptoms of hypokalemia aren't nearly as scary or emergent as those of hyperkalemia, even though changes on ECG are apparent with both. Our patient was ventilated and sedated, so we only had objective assessment data like the lab value, so we wouldn't have been able to assess for muscle weakness or leg cramps, which are typical hallmark signs of hypokalemia. Other signs and symptoms of hypokalemia include dizziness, hypotension, and other symptoms involving the GI system like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal distension. In critically low cases, even paralytic ileus. While not as common with hypokalemia as it is with hyperkalemia, there can be ECG changes or dysrhythmias and potentially cardiac or respiratory arrest. Hyperkalemia, however, can be much more emergent and signs and symptoms can be far more severe, far more quickly, especially at levels between 6.5 and seven milliequivalents per liter and any higher. In hyperkalemia, tall, tented, and peaked T waves and a widened QRS complex can be noticed on ECG. If left untreated, the QR complex will continue to widen and eventually mesh with the T wave. At that point, it's almost imminent that ventricular fibrillation or a systole will occur. Yikes, no thanks. Thankfully, we were on the less dangerous side of the potassium values with our patient's value being only a smidge low. Or were we? We compared the lab value with the physician's electrolyte replacement orders and went to the med room to grab what we needed to replace the patient's potassium. We were replacing it via IV, so in the med room, we grabbed the medication itself and the tubing required to set it up on the pump. Not only had I learned to never push potassium, I learned to never set it up as a secondary or what's also known as a piggyback. It was also the facility policy where I was working at the time to never set up potassium as a piggyback. But when we got back to the patient's room, my preceptor started instructing me to set up the potassium on a secondary tubing to be hooked into the primary tubing above the pump or as a piggyback. When you set up a piggyback, meaning you connect the secondary bag to the primary bag above the pump, and therefore only running that primary line through the pump, there is residual medication from the secondary or the piggyback bag left in the primary line because the primary bag and line is often used for a subsequent compatible medication infusion. That residual from the previous infusion could later infuse into the patient's line with that next medication. If that subsequent medication runs at a faster rate than the potassium in this example, which is super common, you could run the risk of inadvertently bolusing potassium to your patient. That would put you in danger of potentially making your patient acutely hyperkalemic and breaks the rule of never pushing potassium IV. It's very common on the CVICU for patients to have a fluid restriction. So the bag of potassium is really small, like only 100 mils. So it's tough to want to run such a small amount on its own through the pump because there's such a high risk of pulling air into the line if the infusion finishes before the nurse checks back on it. But it's an even bigger risk and major safety concern to piggyback the potassium rather than running it on its own on a primary through the pump. Infusing potassium requires close monitoring 
And in most facilities, it is typically only infused at a rate of 10 milliequivalents per hour. Some ICUs will allow for infusion as fast as 20 milliequivalents per hour, as long as the patient is on a cardiac monitor and it's running through a central line rather than a peripheral line or an IV. In the end, I refused to set up the potassium on a piggyback and grabbed additional tubing so it could run through the pump on its own line as the primary. While my preceptor was super bugged and I dealt with their wrath later oh on, my I knew I had done the right thing, not just according to the policy, but in observance of patient safety. Whenever I run potassium, I set it up as a primary and Y site below the pump into maintenance fluids, as long as there isn't a fluid restriction. Otherwise, most of the CVICU patients have a central line where I can connect the potassium, that primary line, to infuse it directly. Another way that I ensure I don't pull air into my line is to set a timer to go off five to 10 minutes before the infusion is set to finish so that I can monitor the last part of the infusion and avoid pulling air into the line. Additionally, and maybe this makes me crazy, but once the potassium is complete, I also run the line of just fluids for about 15 to 20 minutes at that 10 to 20 mil equivalent per hour rate on its own to help flush the very end of the maintenance fluid tubing. This way, I won't risk bolusing any potassium potentially left in that line where I y sighted it if I use that primary setup for another piggyback medication later on. As a nurse, you will definitely come in contact with patients that present with abnormal potassium levels. To help you quickly spot a patient with low or high levels of potassium and to remember the details about symptoms and treatment, don't forget to download your free cheat sheet at nursing.com slash lab values. The link is in the description below. I stressed about my understanding, passing my classes, and ultimately passing the NCLEX. I found success when I started using nursing.com because it helped me find the must-know information with clear and concise lesson videos, and then I would check my knowledge with the lesson quizzes. I used SimCLEX to not only evaluate if I was ready for the NCLEX, but it would also give me personalized suggestions on what I should study to fill in my knowledge gaps. I could focus on those topics further with custom quizzes and use the additional study tools that are adapted to my personal learning style. I hope this has given you a better grasp on potassium, what it is, what it does in the body, and what happens when the levels just aren't right, and how to safely administer it intravenously. Always remember, follow facility policy and medication administration rules and follow the six rights. Just keep these tips in mind and you'll be ready to tackle anything that comes your way. Now go out, be your best self today, and as always, happy nursing.